Hello and um, welcome to this uh, new session of the Bruegel Annual Meeting 2020. Uh, I'm Nicolas Verrand, Senior Fellow at Bruegel, and I'm uh, absolutely delighted to open this panel with our five panelists, um, uh, Alexandra Dimitrievich, uh, Pierre Wunsch, Martin Merlin, Benoit Curé, and uh, Elena Carletti. Uh, they will speak in that order. I will ask the panelists, I will not present the panelists because they're, I will assume they're well known, known to everybody. Uh, of course, uh, they're uh, extremely knowledgeable in their respective fields and we're extremely grateful for their participation in this session of the Bruegel Annual Meetings. Uh, I will ask panelists to make very brief introductions so that we can keep the uh, conversation flowing. Uh, and we hope to have a lot of interaction uh, in term, uh, given the, the vastness of the topics we want to cover. So uh, I'm not going to hold it further and we'll ask you, Alexandra, uh, Alexandra Dimitrievich uh, from uh, SNP Global uh, to, uh, to give us uh, your view on uh, maybe, you know, um, how you see the situation now in terms of the banking system uh, and in terms of, uh, you know, resilience uh, given the pandemic shock. Yes, uh, hello, Nicola, and uh, hi, everyone. Thank you very much for, for the in invitation to uh, this panel today. So um, how we're seeing the situation today to your question in terms of the, the banking system, um, I think overall, uh, we think that uh, banks have uh, sufficiently strong regulatory capital buffer to absorb uh, um, the, the large shock uh, related to the pandemic. Obviously a big, big difference compared to the great financial crisis is that uh, banks are entering this uh, crisis with a lot stronger uh, capital ratios and liquidity. They've actually been uh, part of the, the solution here in helping making sure uh, that there is continuity in the, the transmission of credit to the real economy uh, during the, the peak of the pandemic. So overall, uh, in aggregate, uh, we think that this uh, should provide some comfort. Um, and if we look at the report for the first half for the bank, we see that in aggregate, the core tier one capital ratios uh, have remained stable, will have uh, been slightly improved and half uh, falling. But overall, obviously, the story isn't over yet. And uh, I think they are, the important point is that there are uh, a lot of uncertainties that remain, both on how the, the virus uh, might unfold, if we might have multiple waves. But I think one particular point um, of, of concern that we have and that we're going to look at very carefully is the implications of uh, the withdrawal of the extraordinary um, support um, over the second half of the year, well into next year, on how that might translate into increase in, uh, in credit losses. And, and what we're seeing, what we're expecting in a study we've published last summer is uh, credit losses to increase to over uh, 200 billion in, in, uh, for Western European banks for 2020-2021, uh, up from 59 in 2019. So to date, we've had very few downgrades of banks, um, but uh, on the other hand, we have more than 40% of banks here in Europe on negative outlook, really flagging all of, of uncertainties that, um, these uncertainties that lie ahead. Thank you, and that's a, that's a great starting point, I guess. So uh, I, I'm turning to Pierre, uh, Pierre Wunsch, uh, the governor of the National Bank of Belgium, of course, uh, and uh, with uh, maybe a question about the banking union, right? Because this is the first big test of the banking union uh, in action. Um, the supervisory framework was put together in 2014, the resolution framework in 2016. So how do you see it at this point? And uh, is the banking union fit for purpose in such a stressed uh, environment? Pierre Wunsch. Uh, thank you. Nicolas, you hear me or you see me? I don't see myself on the, on the screen. Okay. Um, well, I'm, I'm basically in agreement with what Alexandra has, has, has said. I think it's also very important that we don't look at the banking union in isolation of other policies that have been conducted at the European, international, European and national level. Uh, we are, I think this is a well-managed crisis uh, and we are doing uh, all we can to, uh, uh, to absorb the shock 
And there are many interventions at many levels, I'm not going to repeat them, but uh, including guarantees at the national level that have an impact on the way uh, banks are going to be, to be impacted. So this is, this is early days in the crisis, I would say uh, so far so good. Uh, the reaction has been, I guess, uh, the correct one, uh, including at um, monetary policy level. Now, of course, we had the usual suspects before the crisis. They have not disappeared. I tend to believe that EDIS is not such a big issue with the super seniority of deposits. Uh, I think when you get to EDIS, you've already lost the war. Um, but um, my concern would be more on the front of uh, resolution, which has not been tested. I never thought that going for Berlin in a, in a systemic crisis was a, was a good idea. Uh, we are in principle in a Berlin regime, and in practice we do bailout. Uh, so let's see. Uh, but as Alexandra said, uh, this is, these are still early days, and of, of course we are going to uh, be... Uh, you know, in the coming months and years with a number of uh, unsustainables long term. So we are going to have public deficits that probably will not be sustainable. Uh, monetary policy, we have very negative real rates. Uh, how long can that last? So exit is not going uh, to be easy. Uh, but, but yet again, I think the crisis has been so far well managed and we have time. It's not like we have to solve all these issues within the, the next six months or, or even two years. Martin, Martin Merlin, you're the, the point person on banking and many other things at the DG FISMA, the Directorate General for Financial Services at the European Commission. Um, and uh, particularly the European Commission, of course, has to do a lot of things, but uh, also the legislative agenda. In terms of legislative priority, can you give us to start uh, the discussion a little bit of flavor uh, of uh, how the COVID-19 has changed your thinking and priorities? Yes, uh, thank you, thank you, Nicola. I think when the when the crisis uh, broke out, uh, the the priority was to look at the regulatory framework to see if we could uh, identify uh, adaptations, uh, alleviations that could uh, help uh, the financial sector to continue providing uh, funding to uh, to the economy. Uh, and that's why we came up uh, with uh, amendments to the capital requirements regulation to give some uh, breathing space to, uh, to, uh, to the banks. This was uh, swiftly adopted by the legislator. And we also put forward a uh, capital uh, markets uh, package with notably a, a simplified uh, recovery prospectus uh, to uh, facilitate uh, uh, the uh, raising of money on the, on the capital markets. We put forward uh, proposals to amend the uh, securitization framework uh, here as well to give some uh, breathing space to, um, uh, to banks. And we, uh, we proposed uh, amendments to, uh, to MIFID uh, uh, also uh, uh, in order to uh, um, uh, uh, facilitate uh, life of uh, participants on the, on the markets, notably with alleviations in the field of disclosure requirements. And all this is still being discussed in, in Council and Parliament. But of course, these are the um, um, adaptations, the uh, quick fixes that we have identified, but we, uh, we need to look beyond that. Obviously, the uh, financial sector will play uh, an absolutely uh, critical uh, role in uh, financing the projects that will be needed uh, for uh, recovery in, uh, in Europe uh, after the pandemic. Um, only a, a, a fraction of the financing will come from the public sector. The bulk will need to come from uh, the, uh, the private sector. And uh, here I think that uh, what we see is a confirmation of uh, policies which had been launched uh, already for a while uh, in Europe. And uh, we would argue that these policies need to be accelerated. Uh, this is true for uh, the Capital Markets Union, of course. In order to fund the recovery, we will need uh, well-developed, uh, agile, effective uh, market-based uh, finance in Europe. We will need, obviously, a healthy banking sector. I think we do have a, a healthy banking sector right now, which, as was said, is uh, part of the solution instead of being a part of the problem as in the past. But we, we do think in the Commission that uh, discussions on, uh, on banking union uh, should uh, continue, should accelerate, because, uh, as you know, banking union is still not uh, completed. And we think that for confidence in the banking sector, 
confidence in the banking environment, uh, finalizing uh, banking union would be, uh, would be of high value. And then I would mention, of course, uh, two other flagship uh, policies. Um, um, digital transformation. Uh, we need to do more in order to support uh, new technologies, the take up of new technologies in the financial sector in the EU. And that is why we will table uh, an action plan in this regard at the end of the year. And uh, finally, uh, we need to press on uh, with uh, the uh, transition uh, to a, a low carbon economy and a low carbon society. And here we need, uh, we need a, a renewed sustainable finance uh, strategy, which we plan to, uh, to table uh, towards uh, the end of the year uh, 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 at the latest. We lost you, um, uh, Nicola. Uh, we lost you, Nicola. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks. Uh, lots of follow-on questions uh, to come on this agenda, of course. But first, uh, let's look at it from uh, outside. Uh, Benoit, you're the head of the Innovation Hub uh, at the Bank for International Settlements. Of course, everybody knows uh, your experience at the European Central Bank, but you're now outside of the European Union and outside of the Eurozone in Basel. So how does it look at it from, uh, how, do, how do you look at it and uh, look at European financial challenges from the global level, so to say? So yes, uh, thank you, Nicola, and good afternoon from, uh, from Basel. So, um, so I will take a global perspective as you invite me to do, and I'm, I will be happy to dig deeper into, uh, into Europe and issues later, but let me start from the, uh, the view from Basel, which is a global view. Um, and uh, the, short, the short version is, is uh, we, we are at, at a juncture where more than ever we need international cooperation. International cooperation is of the essence, and I'll tell you why, uh, but it's not clear how it can be delivered. So uh, high demand, short supply. Um, and um, and I, see, uh, I see demand for international cooperation both in the micro and in the macro dimension at the current juncture. Uh, at, the, at the micro dimension, uh, when you look at global financial markets, you can see that the COVID crisis in, in the spring has uncovered uh, um, uh, um, impairments in the price discovery mechanisms in global financial markets, which uh, central banks had to fix by uh, throwing a lifeline to, uh, to a number of market segments, and hence directly to a number of non-bank financial institutions uh, to make them function, fun functional again. Um, and it's one thing to, uh, to allow banks to... Uh, to uh, it's, it's one thing to... Um, to um, uh, to allow banks to use their buffers uh, in, a, in, in the face of an acute crisis, but uh, it's another one to let them keep depleted buffers or, or, or to build uh, non-performing loans in the, in the recovery phase. So the first message here is, uh, if we want to keep the global financial system resilient, uh, we need uh, to, uh, to avoid dialing, dialing back everything we've, we've achieved since 2008. And that's, that's, of course, important at the European level, but it's, it's a global discussion. And the second thing is that we need a new impulse uh, to, uh, to improve the resilience of market-based finance. And that's, I mean, honestly, that's work that the Financial Stability Board has left unfinished. But I can say that now that I'm not, no longer a member of it. Uh, and uh, and we, don't want to, we don't want banks, we don't want central banks to be on the hook in the future to bail out uh, non-bank intermediaries just as uh, they've been on the hook before the great financial crisis to bail out banks. So we need a new agenda to... Uh, to rein in uh, market-based uh, finance. Um, and finally, on the macro side, uh, if our conversation had taken place before the summer, I would probably have skipped that. I would have stopped there, right? Uh, before the summer, uh, we were facing a, a global symmetric shock. Uh, support to aggregate demand was needed everywhere, uh, relying primarily on domestic instruments. Uh, and, they, and, and this didn't raise major coordination issues. Uh, and exchange rates were well behaved, uh, which has created a lot of policy space for emerging market economies. Uh, but uh, now, in uh, talking in September, uh, from, from where we are now, uh, one cannot rule out diverging outcomes in the, uh, in the global uh, economy. Uh, recent Fed announcements have created broad market expectations that uh, US rates will remain very low for very long. Uh, if confirmed, this may have mixed effects on the global economy. Emerging market economies are which are largely dollar funded uh, will benefit at least initially from improved financial conditions, but increased debt and, uh, and risk taking may come back later with a vengeance. 
uh, and Europe may need to find new new ways to support its economy uh, uh, in the face of uh, permanently lower uh, U.S. rates. And one can legitimately uh, wonder whether today's global governance is fit for purpose uh, to uh, to cope with a new discussion uh, on exchange rates and on global imbalances. Uh, the fabric of uh, of international cooperation is very thin today. So uh, these are the two questions I wanted to highlight, and I'm happy to go into the uh, the details. Well, of course, part of this is uh, a, a bit dependent on the U.S. election, but uh, not all of it, uh, and, uh, and and we're we're we'll not have the answer to that question, um, of course, in the core in the course of this panel. So, Elena, uh, you're uh, looking at it from inside Europe because you're in Italy, but uh, but 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 very much from uh, with a critical perspective. What do you make of it all? Should we should we be concerned at this point, or should be we be reassured? Um, I, I guess already in this panel we've heard both perspectives. Yes, thank you. So the, the privilege of being the last speaker, I think, is that one can be very brief because a lot has already been said. So I actually share a lot of what has been said. So shall we be reassured? In a way, yes, because as the previous speakers have said, the banks have been a, a, a mitigating factor in this crisis, not an amplifier. We haven't seen a default in the corporate sector, at least not significantly so far. And what we have seen is an increase in stage two loans for banks, but mostly because banks are starting to precautionally set aside the provision for the deterioration of the macroeconomic conditions. So all in all, the banking sector so far has been able to support the economy, thanks also to the public support, to the various programs, and has not somehow been affected so much. But we should not forget that there are, I mean, in my view, there are two problems. The first one is that Although banks have a lot of capital, as Alexandra said, they have, according to the EBA, they have 50% of their loans to non-corporate, uh, to non-financial corporate is in sectors that are exposed to the pandemic. This means that the risk of an increase in uh, problems and in credit risk mostly for banks is quite substantial going forward. So what are my two main concerns at this stage? The first one is the level of profitability of the European banking sector. And this is a concern that, that somehow was already there before, before the crisis. And even more now, because of course the profitability is bound to decrease, not only for the increase in credit risk, but for the whole situation overall. If not at all for the prolongation of the low interest rate environment. So this is a problem. And why is it a problem? Is because banks are unable to generate capital internally and they are going to be even more unable going forward. So that's a problem also in conjunction with the crisis and with the uh, deterioration of credit risk because banks at some point will need the recapitalization. And then the question, how should we recapitalize them? And here, I think the public response is still very behind. In a way, Whereas we have done a lot in terms of how we help the non-financial corporates on how we help the banks, we haven't progressed much so, much so far. So there hasn't been changes in state aid on what concerns precautionary capitalization. We still have the rules of the pre-crisis. And I share the view of Peter that- Sorry, sorry, let me interrupt you. Hasn't been, there been a, a change in the state aid stance on precautionary capitalization in March? But this was for non-financial corporates mostly. For so banks. I was, I mean, maybe Martin knows better than I do, but for banks, there hasn't been much to, to my knowledge. I mean, my understanding of the March communication of the uh, DG no. Comp is that they allow precautionary recapitalization without burden sharing. Uh, Martin, can you enlighten us? Uh, yeah, I think this is correct indeed. Yeah. I thought there was, an, well, maybe then I, I don't know very well, but I thought that there was an article in the communication of state aid in March on precautionary capitalization, but it was quite, let me say, I wouldn't want to use okay, the word we'll, vague, we'll, but it wasn't we'll, very well spelled out. So, but in any case, the precautionary capitalization, in my view, is one of the main concerns that we're going to see going forward for banks. And the second one, I share the concern of PETA that, on the resolution framework. So the BRD is not meant for a systemic crisis. It's meant more, or at least initially, it was meant more for an individual idiosyncratic problem. The tool of Berlin is going to be problematic in a systemic crisis. So the question is whether we should adapt the BRD to the current situation eventually, or we should rather think of a different framework to deal with problems in banks. Let me stop there. Your, uh, Elena, one, uh, one of your many um, uh, uh, duties uh, uh, outside of academia is that uh, you're, you're a board member of Unicor. 
credit, uh, which is a, a generous sponsor of Google, which uh, for which we're all grateful. Uh, do you do you, do you see the banking market evolving uh, in in the absence of new um, of new uh, policy initiatives? Uh, do you or or would you say all banks at this point are in a purely defensive mode, given the, the magnitude of the shock? I think banks at the moment are in capital preservation mode. At least this is the way banks refer to what they're doing now. So they are not looking to generate a profit at the moment. They are mostly trying to preserve capital. Right. Um, so thanks. Uh, I'm very grateful to all panelists for their, uh, not just for the, the depth of the insights they provided us, but also for their time, discipline and brevity, because we want to have a lot of, to cover a lot of uh, ground in this panel. Uh, one, uh, we will now uh, move to, in a way, the Q&A. Uh, we have, as many of you know, a tool that we use at Google called Slido. So it's slide.do, and that's on the web. So, so you have to go to the website. Um, and uh, we have two functionalities on this tool. One is the possibility to ask questions, and I will monitor the questions uh, that get asked on Slido. For the moment, there's one. Uh, but there's another one, which is a poll, and we have a poll question to you all who are in the audience. Do European banks generally have enough capital to weather the COVID-19 recession, which is a running theme of the discussion we already have, and I think something will come back to. So uh, I encourage you, uh, as many as possible in the audience, to answer the poll question, because we will be interested in your uh, collective wisdom. Uh, and uh, and I, I will also monitor the, the questions on the on the Q and A. Um, the one question which I think is uh, is 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 one I, I'd like to ask Martin, uh, an anonymous uh, participant asked this: if this is really the right time to uh, press forward with the green finance agenda, and I guess this connects with uh, a general discussion uh, with the Commission right now whether the uh, uh, climate. Uh, the fight against climate change is a luxury we can afford, given the magnitude of the short-term uh, economic pressures and uh, so and, and and shocks. So um, I guess the answer is yes. Of course, we should continue pressing the green finance agenda. But ca ca can can you give us a bit more color and also uh, how you think the the green agenda will be articulated with other initiatives uh, in your area, which is the area of DG FISMA, so financial uh, services and regulation. Well, very briefly, we are in a situation where, uh, in a way, we have to uh, rebuild uh, parts of our uh, economies. And I think we need to do that uh, in, a, in a sustainable uh, uh, manner. Uh, there's, no, uh, there's no point in uh, trying to rebuild our economies, uh, closing uh, our eyes to, uh, to the major uh, environmental uh, challenges that are uh, uh, in front of us. Um, and which, uh, you know, can severely uh, penalize uh, the sustainability of uh, economic uh, recovery going forward. So since we have to rebuild parts of our economies, uh, we may as well uh, rebuild uh, our economies, um, making sure that we accelerate uh, the transition uh, towards, uh, towards a more green, uh, green economy. I think this is needed for environmental reasons, and uh, it is needed as well, ultimately, for uh, uh, economic reasons. I think there are uh, high expectations in this regard uh, in, uh, in society, um, uh, among, uh, among citizens. And um, uh, as you know, uh, Nicola, the way we see uh, this is that actually we can turn uh, the EU Green Deal into, into a growth uh, strategy. Uh, and there are uh, various uh, avenues uh, through which uh, we can you know, achieve, uh, achieve both aims, uh, namely greening, uh, greening the economy, but also making sure that uh, in a number of areas which are, are crucial in order to green the economy, uh, Europe uh, becomes a, a world leader. Uh, so that uh, uh, this greening of the economy uh, is also beneficial uh, for um, uh, for growth in uh, in uh, in the long run. So we we really do not uh, think that we have uh, any uh, any alternative here, which doesn't mean that uh, uh, it has to be all about greening the economy. 
uh, as you know, the second main uh, pillar okay. is uh, the digi digital transformation, where we do think as well that we can, okay. uh, you know, yeah. um, uh, harness the benefits of digitalization. Green, uh, Benoit on this. Yeah, I actually wanted to make the point about digital transformation because it's also an answer <laughs> to your question, uh, Nicola. I mean, I think I there is a. Martin, then. Yeah, I think the 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 the, the, the uh, major risk that we're facing today is that policymakers or politicians will uh, will uh, will miss the crisis for what it is, which is a, a deep transformation in our economic structures. And it's true that we don't have lots of visibility on what's going to come out of it. Uh, and it's, I guess it's uh, the job of economists to, to do that and to clarify. But um, that can create new sources of divergence. So if you take, for instance, uh, digital, di digitalization, uh, there is a risk that different economies will, uh, will, um, will embrace the new wave of digitalization at different speeds. Uh, and when it comes to technology, winner take all is the name of the game. And that might also be true of, uh, of, green, trans of the green transformation and of green finance. So if you're in a world where lots of the small guys will be deeply hurt by the crisis, uh, you'll see lots of SMEs uh, going, uh, going uh, belly up, uh, you see uh, zombie firms going up, etc. And on the other hand, you see uh, large uh, global companies kind of uh, capturing all the, all the gains from this crisis. And it's, I know it's a very awful way to put it, but that's, that's the way they think about it. Um, if, you, if you are in, the, in this winner-take-all uh, world, uh, those who will, uh, will be the first movers will capture all the gains. And that can create a deep divergence in the longer term. And as a European, I very much hope that, uh, that uh, Europe will raise the opportunity. Um, a question, uh, I think, which both Alexandra and, um, and Benoit uh, raised uh, in terms of the, the worries for the near future is a, is the withdrawal of all the extraordinary support measures and, uh, and, and, and how the financial system will react when there is a form of exit from uh, emergency crisis mode. Um, Pierre, you're, the, you're the, the national policymaker on this panel, so to say. Uh, so uh, this question maybe is to you. Uh, how, how do you see that going forward? Do you think there is a risk of uh, a premature or uncoordinated exit from emergency measures? Uh, or is it rather the contrary, is that the temptation will be to keep them for longer than they should really be because uh, that will create moral hazard? How do you think about that particular aspect of the challenges of the moment? Well, uh, in theory, I think it, it, it shouldn't be too big of a problem. Uh, uh, there is broad agreement to what needed to be done. And in theory, there is, should be broad agreement that we need to find a way to land on those capital releases uh, and support measures. I'm really concerned about the political dynamics of it all, and I'm afraid that uh, some people will want to uh, go too fast, some people will want not to do anything. And uh, so the, I'm, I'm afraid of the political dynamics going down the road. Um, I mean, the green stuff, uh, directionally I agree, but it remains a supply shock. And I'm a bit afraid that um, we'll hear more and more that the solution is just to print more money and to spend more money, and the day uh, of reckoning will come at some point. And maybe the dividing lines that we had on some of yeah. those issues before the crisis, I'm a bit concerned that they will come back with a revenge and, and, and actually uh, stronger than, than they even existed before the crisis on the need either to go back to some kind of normality or to go for something that would look like at the end of the day, going back, I guess, I guess, to the mistakes that we did in the 80s. So when I look at the political dynamics of it uh, all, and it's in the US, it's in Europe, you hear more and more people saying, you know, rates are very low, so just let's spend money, and there should not be any end to it. And so I think the Commission will have a role, a central role there. Um, and it's, it's not about going too fast. I think we should probably still need to support the economy in 21. And it will depend on how uh, it evolves, but uh, I think we, we need to, to, to build as fast as possible a consensus on the need to exit in a way that is orderly. And again, as long as we are between academics and people that understand those issues uh, and that are in the broad consensus about what needs to be done, I'm not concerned. I'm, I'm really concerned about, it, about political dynamics of it all. Um, so in the US, okay. you know, who would defend uh, the, you know, 
policies, uh, new, new market, uh, mo new modern monetary theory. I feel it's coming to Europe, uh, and I'm a bit afraid of that. Right. Um, well, modern monetary theory, um, which I guess can be unfairly summarized as a view that public debt doesn't count as something that uh, is uh, purely a US debate right now, right? Um, so, um, connected with this question of the pace of going back to normality, even so we're very far from normality right now, um, I have a question on a uh, slide from uh, Hiro Hayasaki. Uh, on the implementation of the final part of Basel III, uh, which some uh, bank lobbies call Basel IV. Uh, I don't know for whom this question is, maybe for Benoit or for, um, or for you, Pierre, again. But um, uh, what is, uh, or actually for Martin, Martin, um, how, how, wait, give us a later thinking on this, right? Because the Commission has to propose legislation to implement this major package of uh, further reforms uh, from the previous round of crisis. Uh, and uh, how uh, how did the COVID-19 crisis affect your thinking on this? Yes, the, uh, as you know, the, the Basel Committee uh, decided uh, to postpone uh, the uh, application of the uh, full Basel III package by, by one year, uh, given uh, the COVID-19 situation. Um, so this gives uh, the Commission a little bit more time to uh, to prepare its uh, its legislative proposal, which we plan to uh, to table uh, in the first uh, half of uh, of next year. Um, within uh, within the Basel Committee, I think uh, within the jurisdictions, the view is very much that uh, what was decided in terms of. Uh, uh, the architecture of the final Basel III package uh, still makes uh, eminent sense and that uh, we should not uh, uh, use the crisis in order to unpick what, uh, what had been agreed because the principles and the fundamentals of the reform are right. But we have to uh, really pay attention uh, to the you know, phasing in of the reform, and we have to, uh, to make sure that uh, the new rules kick in uh, at a time where there is no risk of aggravating the crisis and uh, 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 introducing uh, more, more deleveraging. So the decision has been uh, postponing by, by one year, um, um, so this is taking place, and uh, normally uh, uh, negotiations in the EU should start uh, in, I would say, the second quarter of uh, of next year on the EU transposition of the uh, the, the final Basel III standards. Oh, thank you. That was very uh, specific. Um, Alexandra, I have an, a bunch of questions about the banking market structure, and maybe I'll ask you and uh, also uh, Elena to comment on this. Uh, and if all other panelists want to jump in, uh, they should um, let me know. Um, Jack Schickler asks uh, two questions uh, on Slido. One is, isn't this whole shock of COVID-19 in a way an opportunity to accelerate what everybody kind of rhetorically agrees is needed, which is, you know, a, a consolidation of the European banking market, especially in the Eurozone, the exit from, uh, of some banks from the market, because we know there are too many banks uh, and they're not all viable. Um, and, uh, and, and so should that be viewed as policymaker, by policymakers as an opportunity? Uh, how do you look? you look at it as somebody who looks at the market? Also, um, he asks uh, about, you know, there, there have been recurring press articles about uh, a bad bank, uh, ECB lobbying for a bad bank, maybe. Um, that's uh, rumored uh, on, a, on a recurring basis. Uh, so, so basically, this whole question of the restructuring of the banking systems, uh, uh, bringing it back to a sounder structure, not just in terms of capital, but also in terms of the viability of uh, business not just at the level of individual banks, but also at the level of the sector as a whole. So, sorry, my question is far too long, but, uh, but how, to, how, how do you look at these issues? How do you see opportunities in the current moment for policymakers and for um, entrepreneurial bankers? Uh, and uh, how does it affect your thinking on, uh, on the banking industry? Yes. Um, yeah, that, that's, uh, that, that's a very good question. If I may, uh, Nicola, just uh, one one quick minute on the on the previous point, and I get to that because I thought that the 
really the discussion on uh, on the pace of uh, pace of the phase out of this extraordinary support is uh, is is really um, critical and it's really a very delicate balance here between preserving the social and economic fabric by not going too fast, but at the same time as well looping back to the first question on uh, on digital. Um, investment on green investment, it is really very important if we want to sustain this higher leverage in the economies that we build uh, a sustainable growth and that we keep productive companies. So just wanted to, to put that on the table and, and we'll uh, maybe come back on it later. But to your point that in, indeed, um, that, that's one of the, the specificities of uh, a bank in, here in Europe, maybe especially compared to the other regions, is that there are uh, some some structural um, uh, low profitability compared uh, to other region, and, and, and there might be here uh, an, an opportunity uh, through through this crisis to push towards uh, more uh, consolidation uh, in uh, in in the sector. So that's uh, to the point that Benoit was mentioning at the beginning. Can we? take the opportunities of, of this crisis maybe to reset uh, for, for a, a stronger Europe and a stronger growth. Um, that's a very general answer to my question. Elena, how, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned profitability, but how, do you, how, how should we think of, uh, you know, reordering the market, not, in, not just, I mean, as I mentioned, you're, you're, you're a, you're a board member at Unicredit, so I'm not going to ask you what the strategy there will be. But if you look at it uh, from a policymaker's perspective, should policymakers uh, take active measures uh, in uh, in that direction? You mentioned recapitalization. How do you think about the bad bank concept, and uh, and and how assertive should be the stance in terms of market structure? So let me let me start first from the consolidation issue. Let me start making a general uh, statement. So since I joined the board of Unicredit, I realized that policymaking is one thing that affects banks a lot, but the other agent that affects banks, in particular the public listed, is the market. So why do I say that? Because many things that the policymaker may be doing at the end of the day are not picked up by banks simply because markets don't follow the policymaking. So think, for example, of the flexibility that the regulation has given to banks to decrease or to use the buffers of capital in recent times. We haven't seen much use of these capital buffers. And the reason is that banks are concerned that the markets may not like it if they use these buffers. So this, why this related to uh, consolidation? Because if you had asked, like, if you had seen investor survey before the crisis, investors did not like the idea of consolidation in the banking sector. They were very negative about it. And this is also why banks have not mm. consolidated much in the last decade, in particular across border. Now investors are more positive towards consolidation. And you see, and we have seen the first signs of consolidation. For example, in Italy, Intesa has just acquired the Ubi Bank, forming the second largest bank in Europe. So, but what type of consolidation we are going to see going forward is important. So I think policymakers would prefer cross-border mergers, although maybe they don't officially or very clearly say that because they're also afraid about the fragmentations and so on. Investors may prefer domestic consolidation because it's easier to achieve economies of scale, increase profitability, and, and therefore create the synergies. So if I had to make a guess, I would imagine, and this has nothing to do with unit credit, of course, that we are going to see consolidation going forward. But we may see more domestic consolidation rather than cross-border consolidation. Because at the end of the day, this is what, in the short term at least, would benefit <coughs> markets and investors, and probably would help the low market evaluation of banks. So all I, the questions, yeah, sorry. Go I ahead. Stop you. No, I just wanted to come back to the bad bank issue. I think, so I may be surprised when I enter this, and I don't, you know, I don't want to give the impression I lobby for banks, but once the crisis hit the real economy, the immediate public response was to save all companies, basically. Because somehow we, this is an exogenous shock, and all the companies that were uh, solvent before the crisis received <coughs> some form of support. And I think this was the right, the right approach at the beginning of the crisis. But as we go 
in the crisis, we should switch from a generalized support to a more specific support. But the same method for banks. So banks are entering this crisis that clean up a lot of their balance sheet, but they're also subject to a big exogenous shock. So okay. I am in fa- I'm in favor of the bad bank for that reason, because, I mean, in a way, we need some help for them. So for you, bad bank is synonymous to subsidies to bank? No, it's not synonymous to subsidy because it depends on the transfer price. So it, it all depends on how you set it up and what would eventually be the transfer price. So it's not a subsidy, not necessarily at the least. Okay. Uh, I have a question of clarification to, um, to Alexandra uh, before I give the floor to Benoit. Uh, Julia is asking uh, whether there's a negative outlook that you mentioned at the beginning on uh, many bank ra- credit ratings are concentrated within specific countries in Europe or, or is there kind of a broad-based uh, phenomenon? Uh, do you have the, that at hand, Alexandra? Yes, so uh, I can uh, can get the statistic. It, it's uh, spread uh, around a, a number of countries. There's uh, quite a lot of that uh, in the, of the negative outlooks in uh, the UK, uh, but we also have uh, negative outlooks let me um, get here in a number of countries where you have more exposure to um, uh, of of the economy to to the shock. So we have um, uh, here in the UK we have Lloyd and Barclays, uh, but it's really across a number of geographies. It's not concentrated in a single country. We have in Spain, in Germany, in France. So it's more general trend. It's forty percent. Of, of the European bank, really. So I, I suspect the, the question behind the question was, is it a matter of South versus North in the Eurozone? And your answer is no, it's not really that. It's broader, yes. Okay. Benoit, um, you've been at the center of the creation of the banking union uh, and you played an instrumental role in this. How do you look at it uh, now that you're outside? Uh, look, I'm not going to say anything specific on, on European banks or European uh, uh, European uh, regulation because I'm not in a good place to do that. But but uh, with with hindsight, I mean, if you if you if you contrast the situation today and the situation before the COVID-19 uh, crisis struck, I mean, the uh, a lot of the European actions towards banks and European strategy and approach has been predicated on the assumption that there would be a uh, steady return to nominal growth and that banks would have time to. Uh, tidy up their balance sheets and fix their, their problems, right? Or at least at least, let's say a few years have been about slowly understanding the issues and waking up to the issues. <laughs> and then once they were understood, uh, the strategy that came out of this was, uh, let's give them time, right? And that made a lot of sense, provided that you would have this prospect of uh, returning to nominal growth. Uh, that is to, to have some kind of a beautiful debt deleveraging, as, as people call it. Um, that's gone, that environment is gone, right? Uh, there, is a, there is huge uncertainty. Uh, there is no uh, guarantee today that nominal growth would come back. Also, inflation is, uh, is, is extremely low, which doesn't help. Um, plus, uh, as, as already said, we see a, an acceleration of digital transformation, which is uh, in itself an additional challenge to banks, right? Which was there before the crisis, but it, now it's, it's, it's being stepped up, right, as a challenge. Um, and if, if there is anything we learned from the great financial crisis is that it, it doesn't serve any purpose to leave the banking sector uh, in a cloud of uncertainty when you have to, uh, to go out of a crisis, right? So the kind of strategy which implies forbearance and giving banks a lot of time, that might have been right uh, before the crisis, uh, but uh, that will have to change. So that can have uh, pretty radical consequences, Benoit. So are you, are you advocating uh, that... Uh, there should be a tough love approach right now, that there should be triage of the banks, uh, that um, uh, essentially uh, policymakers should kind of take control a la TARP, or, or, or do I read you incorrectly? No, I'm, 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 not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that policymakers should know where they want to go. That is, that is, and that's, that's the role of the Commission and the ECB, but there should be a clear vision of uh, where the European uh, banking system should be in, say, five to ten years. So you, you, cannot, you cannot leave it to banks to uh, kind of uh, uh, slowly and, uh, and uh, opportunity, opport, opport, opportunistically uh, uh, improve their balance sheets. That's not going to work. So you need a direction. You need to set a direction. And then the market can do it. So I'm not saying that there should be a, a public uh, intrusion into, into all these decisions, right? 
uh, but there has to be a decision, a, a direction. And by the way, that direction has to be consistent with the general economic uh, strategy of the, of the union as uh, embodied in the, uh, in, the, in the recovery plan and in the green strategy. So it's all, it all has to be consistent, but there is a need to set a direction here. Uh, so, sorry to press you, but, uh, but this is really interesting. When you say set a direction, what instrument do you have in mind? Is that higher capital requirements? Is it something different? Well, there has, I think there has, there, there has to be a clear message to, to banks uh, that uh, consolidation is, uh, is welcome. Uh, and uh, there has to be, and that has been said by other speakers, and in particular by Pierre, but, but, but also others, there has to be an, a regulatory environment that is conducive to that, that is, which implies that the, uh, the, uh, the last step toward banking union has to be taken. And some of the issues that have been left kind of behind the carpet uh, last year in the last round of discussion on the banking union, like home host and you know all these issues and investment banking versus commercial banking, etc. Uh, these issues cannot be uh, cannot be uh, left in the uh, uh, in the dark. I mean, you need to uh, you need to confront this and and set a strategy so that banks know what they can do, what they cannot do, and so that market prices can adjust. So it's so a time for clar- saying- it's a time for clarification. That's what I'm what I'm saying. So what you're saying is that uh, legislators should get to. Um, to uh, completing the banking union, but we know that it's very contentious and will take time. So it's a different time horizon, right? I mean, if we, well, if, even, even assuming the European Commission would have a, a project tomorrow morning, uh, there would be at least one year of legislative debate, which in, in the COVID context is extremely long, no? Yeah, so that's that's fine. But now, now that I'm outside of this, I have the luxury to say that if that happens, then you, that means leaving banks to their own devices and you may, you may not like the outcome. I see. Um, so, um, Martin, uh, <laughs> this is uh, back to you, right? I mean, completion of the banking union is something you have mentioned. You have said that uh, the Commission was thinking of accelerating this. Um, but I have, I have two questions in that matter. And I guess by completion of the banking union, we really mean making resolution work as in initially intended, which, as Pierre said, is not the case. Uh, on the experience of the last few years, because we say we won't bail in, but we do bail out every time there is a problem. Uh, and, uh, and the other one, of course, is deposit insurance, which has also been mentioned by Pierre. Um, so, um, and, and other questions on uh, the regulatory treatment of sovereign exposures, maybe, and, uh, and, and, and related issues. So all this is very difficult. We know that. Um, my two questions are the following, specifically. Uh, does it make sense to go back to this issue in the midst of a major crisis, or is it something that you know can only be tackled when things are a bit calmer? So, is it, uh, how do you see this trade-off? Right. On the one hand, uh, it's important to give a sense of direction, as Benoit just said, but on the other hand, hand having if having a, a legislative debate that will last for a number of quarters at least uh, can be disruptive. And the other one is next generation EU, of course, because we now have uh, this major step forward uh, that was agreed on in July. We will have massive issuance of EU debt. It's a kind of EU safe asset. If uh, some of us want to call it a eurobond, I guess we have a license for that, even though that's not the official language. Uh, and, uh, and, and so uh, how does it reshape the bank- debate about banking union? For example, if we think of regulatory treatment of sovereign exposures, my impression is it's potentially game changer. So um, uh, back to you. Yes, thank you, Nicola. Um, first to rebound on, uh, on what Benoit said, I, I would love a situation where the commission would uh, set the direction and then the market and the member states would follow. And fortunately, it's a little bit more difficult, difficult than that. I think we we have been clear in the Commission on, on, on where we think the future should uh, should lie. We think we need uh, we need co- consolidation. We need uh, more cross-border consolidation in order to have uh, more profitability in the banking uh, in the banking sector. Uh, but uh, we have to uh, to admit that uh, you know member states uh, take uh, different views uh, on uh, on the matter. Uh, and the uh, interests of uh, the member states do not seem to be well aligned, be it on uh, consolidation of the banking sector, but also on, uh, on, on, on banking union at, at, at large. We think uh, in the Commission in particular that large cross-border banks should uh, 
uh, should have um, it should be easier for them to manage capital and liquidity on a cross-border basis because that's an important incentive uh, to uh, foster uh, cross-border consolidation and I think uh, market analysts would see that uh, as extremely important uh, too but unfortunately unfortunately we haven't we haven't managed to uh, to uh, to get uh, to a consensus on a way forward with uh, with the member states on uh, on, on on that now uh, but you know as you know uh, discussions are continuing uh, with uh, with the member states now on 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 sequencing and 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 priorities i think it's fair to so, say uh, that sorry to interrupt you yes. are they actively continuing or are oh, they yes. continuing yes 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 uh, i don't know what uh, your definition of uh, active uh, is uh, uh, but uh, yes no no I, I was getting to that i think it's it, it's fair to say that um, over the last few months the priority notably uh, under the uh, croatian presidency has been to uh, you know take care of the uh, of the uh, pandemic situation and the uh, the economic fallout of uh, of uh, of the pandemic uh, but uh, uh, there's a acknowledgement now that uh, we need uh, to get back to uh, to uh, structural long term issues and uh, and discussions uh, are taking place uh, with the member states on the various uh, facets of uh, of banking union be it uh, uh, home host issues edis reforming uh, the crisis management framework which is uh, as uh, as you know uh, not uh, not optimal but um, i think it's fair to say as well that the discussions remain difficult because uh, the uh, the interests of the member states are not necessarily aligned we'll have to see uh, what uh, what the situation is at the end of uh, of the german uh, the german presidency but uh, in view of the commission banking union remains really uh, highly important and uh, should not be put on the back burner because uh, because of the crisis uh, and um, we definitely plan to uh, to push the member states in order to uh, to make progress in this field we've tried to have a, an all encompassing approach tackling all the issues that uh, are important for the future of the banking sector um, we have to see under the German presidency if that can still work or if we should change tack and maybe have really uh, uh, essential priorities in order to improve the banking uh, environment uh, going, uh, going forward. And here I think uh, reforming the crisis management framework and BRRD is important because it doesn't work as, uh, as intended. I have a specific question because we're getting nearer to the end, uh, also on the Commission's agenda on a slightly different issue, but uh, which uh, I think is extremely important, which is anti-money laundering. Um, there is a feeling out there that there was a lot of momentum on this issue uh, to create a, a more consistent supervisory framework uh, back in, um, back in uh, oh, I see the... I see Bruegel is putting the, 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 the results of the poll uh, on the screen um, because they want to distract me. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, your, uh, your, your assessment is that banks, uh, by and large, uh, may have enough capital after all. This is, I think we had a bit more than 40 votes, so it's not a huge number. But, uh, but, but, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting outcome. Uh, thank you, Yannick. I think you can uh, remove the, 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 that from the screen. So back to my question, uh, um, uh, Martin. Um, there was, as I said, momentum on AML supervision at the end of last year. So there's a bit of a feeling which may be unfair that the momentum is being lost. Uh, can you give us a sense of whether uh, the commission will put out as much enough energy and enough, uh, you know, uh, fuel into the discussion so that it gets through uh, in the foreseeable future. No, no. Uh, again, uh, as for banking union, the momentum is still uh, very much there, especially in the Commission. Uh, we produced an action plan to reform uh, our uh, AML uh, framework in the EU back in May. So we are now uh, uh, working on the implementation of this action plan, and we, we, we do plan to uh, uh, table uh, a very ambitious uh, legislative package uh, on that uh, uh, early next year. 
but I mean, it simply takes time to prepare, and uh, the situation, uh, the current situation, makes it uh, even more uh, even more difficult. But uh, the fact that we did not have uh, very recently major AML scandals doesn't mean at all that uh, the momentum is lost. And I know that uh, the member states are working on um, on uh, council conclusions on uh, on the matter. And I, I do think that uh, we will see also a, uh, an ambitious uh, approach uh, emerging in the Council, and the European Parliament has adopted uh, a resolution which uh, also sets the bar fairly high. So the momentum okay. is there, it's just taking a little bit of time, uh, Nicolas. So let's hope we don't need another huge AM, uh, money laundering scandal to, to get that going. Uh, Elena, the, the, the last question for you, uh, and uh, one anonymous um, Participant asked the question, uh, what about the sovereign bank nexus right now? I mean, is it, uh, do we still have the good old sovereign bank ne nexus as before? Uh, I'd like to have your uh, assessment of that, especially in the view of the next generation you deal with, because uh, Martin didn't really enter that, uh, which I can understand, frankly, um, <laughs> given where he sits. But, uh, but, but, but how do you think of the transformation of the, of the debate on banking union uh, by uh, the emergence of, uh, uh, again, uh, call it a euro bond or not, but uh, EU debt uh, in vast volumes. Well, uh, it's inevitable that we are going to have a, a large increase in public debt in Europe and elsewhere. I think this is inevitable. But I think, I mean, if I have to somehow use the word that Mario Draghi used recently, this is an increase in good debt if it is well spent rather than in bad debt. So it's a necessary and uh, we know it. Uh, it's coming. So relative to your, uh, um, so what is very important to me is how this debt is uh, used and what is spent for. So that is what will eventually foster growth and the recovery, not so much the level of debt in itself, because we know this is inevitable to support the economy at the moment. In terms of doom loop with banks, I mean, banks, uh, there will be buyer of sovereign Uh, it seems that you're freezing, uh, Elena. Oh, we don't hear you anymore. Uh, okay, well, uh, that's unfortunate uh, to have a technical difficulty at the very end, but uh, this is um, uh, the end of the panel because we want to end on, on time. Uh, we will end on this note of suspense um, on what uh, Elena's wisdom would have been. Uh, but uh, I think we can... Um, say we covered a lot of ground. And uh, I want to uh, thank very uh, heartily uh, all our uh, panelists because uh, I was a bit harsh with the time discipline, but I think it allowed us to address a number of very important topical questions about the financial and especially the banking sector right now in Europe. So thanks very much to the panelists. Thanks, for, thanks very much to the audience for the engagement. Thanks very much to the Bruegel team. Uh, for uh, making it happen because there is a lot of team effort uh, in, uh, in uh, preparing those sessions. Uh, and I look forward to the continuation of the, of the Bruegel annual meetings. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for uh, participating. Um, this session is adjourned.